In this short video, we're going to talk about fundamental matrix spaces. So you should understand that a matrix space is going to be a subspace. So there are four fundamental matrix subspaces, or associated with any matrix, we can define four fundamental subspaces. So we're going to start with a matrix that has n columns and m rows. And we'll define the row space to be the span of the rows of A. And the column space is going to be the span of the columns of A. The null space is the set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation AX equals 0. Now I said there are four, and there are four, but before we can discuss the fourth fundamental matrix space, we have to be able to uh, transform the matrix, well, in a very simple way. What we're going to do is interchange the rows and the columns of the matrix A to create a new matrix, which we call A transpose, or the transpose of A. And we have the notation is we write A with a superscript capital T. And so that tells us it's A transpose. And what we're going to do is put the columns of A transpose will be from the rows of A and the rows of A transpose are the columns of A. I think it's easiest if we just look at an example. So here's a matrix A. It has three rows and two columns. A transpose is going to have two rows and three columns. The first row of A transpose was the first column of A. The second row is the second column. Or you could look at it as the first row of A becomes the first column of A transpose. And the second row becomes the second column of A transpose. And the third column of A becomes the third column of A transpose. So once we've defined A transpose, we can say that the fourth fundamental space is the null space of A transpose, uh, which is just the solution set to the homogeneous equation A transpose times Y equals 0. Now, A and A transpose are uh, connected very closely, and their matrix spaces are as well. So it makes sense that if the rows of A are the columns of A transpose, then the row space of A is going to be the column space of A transpose. And those live in Rn. Remember, n is the number of columns in A. The column space of A is the same as the row space of A transpose, and they live in Rm. The null space of A uh, belongs to Rn, whereas the null space of R A transpose belongs to Rm. So we'd like to be able to compute a basis for each one of these four spaces. And we're going to rely on the Gauss-Jordan algorithm to help us perform that computation. So let's start with the row space. Elementary row operations do not change the row space of a matrix. So if we have the matrix R, as the reduced row echelon form of A, then I can just look at the non-zero rows of R, and those will form a basis 
for the row space of A. To get the null space, I'm going to have to find a, a solution, a general solution or a basis for the solution space to the null space of R. The number of vectors in that null space is going to be the number of free columns in R. And, of course, that is the dimension of the null space. Remember, the dimension of a subspace is the number of basis vectors for that subspace. And finally, uh, the basis for the column space, we've seen this in other applications where we're trying to find minimum spanning sets or basis for a set of vectors or for the span of a set of vectors. Uh, the columns of A corresponding to the leading columns of R form a basis for the column space of A. And what will we do for A transpose? or the null space of A transpose, well, we would apply the same theorem here. We would have to take A transpose, transform it to reduced row echelon form. Unfortunately, there's no connection between the matrix R, which is the reduced row echelon form of A, and the reduced row echelon form of A transpose. There's no connection between those matrices, so they have to be computed separately. So let's take an example. Here I have a matrix A. It has four rows and five columns. And I've already found the matrix R, which is the reduced row echelon form of A. So we'd like to find bases for our four fundamental matrix spaces. Well, first, let's start with the row space. I can see that there are two rows which are not all zeros. So those rows, if I consider those as the components of a vector, will form the basis vectors for the row space. Now, it's kind of awkward to deal with um, fractions in or fractional uh, components in a vector. So what I'll do is I'll uh, go ahead and multiply the first vector by 2. I'll multiply the second vector by 4 to clear the fractions and I'll get alternate basis vectors. They're still basis vectors. They're still linearly independent. They still span the row space, but there's no fractions. For the column space, I can see that the leading columns are 1 and 2. That's where I have my leading ones. So I don't take those columns from R. I have to go back to A, look at the corresponding columns, and those column vectors would form a basis for the column space. For the null space, I need to find the solution to well, Rx equals 0. So I'd have x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Of those, only x1 and x2 are leading, so the other three are free variables. So I should expect to find three basis vectors. So if I go ahead and set x3 equal to the parameter r, x4 equals the parameter s, and x5 equals the parameter t, then I'll get to the complete solution. And I've skipped a few steps here, but we should be used to this by now. We would see that x1, remember there is this column of zeros over here, that is understood. So this would say x1 is 3 halves x3 plus 1 half x4 plus 3 uh, x5. And if I put the proper parameters in, in place of x3, x4, and x5, then 
I would get the first component in these three vectors. And then I would do the same thing for uh, x2. And of course, this one here tells me that x3 equals r. This one tells me x4 equals s. And this one in the third vector says that x5 equals t. And so any vector in the null space is a linear combination of these three linearly independent vectors. So those form a basis for the null space. Now, if you look at these vectors in the null space, there is a, a simple pattern. And so it's possible to do site reading. So you can just read the basis of the null space from the reduced row echelon form. So let's look at the first vector, where I have a 3 halves, a 1 half, a 1, and two zeros. Well, the 3 halves and the negative 1 half, this is referring to uh, the in the third column. Right? So in the third column, I have a 1 in the third component. The first two components are just the opposite of the first two row entries in that column. And so instead of negative 3 halves, I have positive 3 halves. Instead of 1 half, I have negative 1 half. The third component is 1 because I'm working with the third column. And the remaining entries are 0. So if I went to the fourth column, I would have a 1 in the fourth component. In the first two components, I would have a positive 1 half, then a negative 3 fourths. 0 in the third component, and then 1 in the fourth component, 0 in the fifth component, which is what we saw here. And then finally, in the uh, corresponding to the fifth column, because it's the fifth column, I'll have a 1 in the fifth component. The first two components will be positive 3 and negative 4, and then everywhere else is 0. So that's a nice uh, way to quickly see the basis for a null space. Now, for a transpose, if I'm going to find its null space, I'm going to have to first form a transpose. So I have interchanged the rows and columns of a to get a transpose. And then I'll have to go through the work to transform that to reduced row echelon form. So uh, I only have, again, two leading ones. That makes sense. Um, the uh, row space of a transpose uh, is going to be the column space of A. But we're only interested in the null space, so let's go ahead and see if we can't use our site reading here. So a basis for the null space should have, well, two vectors, basis for the null space of A transpose. So my first vector I'm going to have the opposite of these entries. So I'm going to have a negative 1, another negative 1, it's the third column, so the third component is going to be 1, and the fourth component is 0. So now remember that what we're solving here is A transpose Y equals 0. In order to make this multiplication defined, Y should have the same number of 
components as there are entries in each row. So in order to make this matrix vector multiplication, so that's how I know that I'm going to have four uh, components. And then the second vector Well, uh, I would change the sign. Changing the sign on 0 doesn't change it at all. Then it's going to be a negative 1. This is the fourth column. So I'll have a 1 in the fourth component and then 0 everywhere else. So that should be the basis for the null space of A transpose. And sure enough, if I were to go through and actually set up our two parameters for the free variables and uh, calculate the solution space, we would see that any vector in that solution space can be written as the linear combination of the vectors that we wrote down on the previous slide. And so that gives us our basis. All right. In our example, the dimension of the row space was the same as the dimension of the column space, and that is always true. And we call that number, which is the dimension of the row space and the dimension of the column space. And remember, dimension is the number of basis vectors. We call that the rank of A. So the rank of A you can get from either the dimension of the row space or the dimension of the column space because those are equal to each other. Now nullity is the dimension of the null space. So both rank and nullity are numbers. They're positive or positive integers or they could be zero. So you could have a rank of a matrix which is zero. That can only happen if the matrix A consists of all zeros. You could also have a nullity of A equaling zero. And that can happen in many cases. That's just when the, the rank of the matrix is the same as the number of columns in the matrix. So how are a and A transpose related in terms of the rank? Well, their ranks are exactly equal to each other. And that should make sense because the row space of A is the column space of A transpose. And therefore, the number of basis vectors in the row space of A is the same as the number of basis vectors in the column space of A transpose. And both of those then would equal their respective ranks. So the rank of the matrix A is the same as the rank of the matrix A transpose. Now this is a lot of symbols, but it really just says that, okay, repeating that the rank of A is the same as the rank of A transpose, and it could be zero, but only when A consists of only zero entries. And then it's always going to be smaller than the smaller of the number of rows and the number of columns. And that should make sense. That uh, if you have three rows and five columns, then uh, the row space can't have more than three basis vectors. On the other hand, if you have uh, five rows and three columns, then the column space can't have any more than three basis vectors. So whatever the smaller one is, uh, that is going to be a bound on the rank of the matrix. What about the nullity? Well, the nullity uh, could be zero. Uh, here, this is the number of columns minus the number of rows. It could actually be a negative number, but certainly nullity, uh, the smallest nullity can be is zero. So zero is bigger than a negative number. 
and the largest it could be is the number of columns. That's the maximum size there. And then for A transpose, you have A, again, when you have A transpose, M represents the number of columns in A transpose. So full rank is uh, an important idea. Uh, we say that the matrix A has full rank if its rank is equal to the smaller of the number of rows and the number of columns. If it equals the number of columns, we say it has full column rank. If it equals the number of rows, we say it has full row rank. And A is going to have full column rank if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. And similarly, a has full row rank if and only if the rows of A are linearly independent. And there's a very nice formula which connects the rank and the nullity of a matrix, which says that if you have a matrix with M rows and N columns, the rank of A plus the nullity of A is going to equal the number of columns. Now for A transpose, A transpose would have M columns. And so in any case, the rank plus the nullity is the number of columns in the matrix. So let's talk about the general solution to this matrix equation, AX equals B. So super important fact is that that system of equations is consistent if and only if the right-hand side vector B belongs to the column space of A. Really, remember that the matrix vector multiplication A times X really represents a linear combination of the columns of A. And so to say that AX equals B means that B can be written as A linear combination of the columns of A, which of course would mean that it belongs to the column space of A. So now consider, well, if you have a consistent system, so B is in the column space, B can be written as a linear combination of the columns of A, we're just going to pick one solution. There could only be one solution, but there may be infinitely many solutions. We're just going to take one. We're going to call it a particular solution, and that's why we put the subscript P. X of P is just one solution. Then the vector X is a solution to our system of equations if it can be written, and only if it can be written in the form or as the sum of my particular solution plus some other vector which belongs to the null space of A. So if you think about this, if I do the vector algebra here, if I multiply A times the vector x, that's going to be A times my particular solution plus some vector in the null space. And I can use some distributive properties here. I'll take a times x sub p plus a times x sub n. But x sub n is in the null space. So I'm going to get from a times x sub n just the 0 vector. And a x p, well, x sub p is the is a solution. So a x sub p is going to give me the vector b. And so that says that a x equals b.
So we're going to introduce a new concept. It's called a translate. Um, we kind of saw this when we were talking about planes. Uh, we said that a plane that doesn't pass through the origin is a translate of a plane that does pass through the origin. And so the general solution to a, a linear system is really a translate of the null space. What are we doing? We're taking the x sub n represents the vectors in the null space. And x sub p it is our translate. So we're taking all of the vectors in the null space and we're just moving them by x sub p. Now you have to be a little bit careful here. Obviously the null space is a subspace, but when you take a translate with a non-zero vector, uh, the resulting translate is not a subspace. And that should be clear because it's not passing through the origin. The origin is no longer in that translate. And so the solution set of our matrix equation is a translate of the null space of A. All right, so let's look we're going to create a little table here. We're going to look at the general solution when you have a full rank coefficient matrix. So the matrix A is full rank. If I have an underdetermined system, which means that I have more variables than I do uh, equations, and the shape would be something that is short and wide, then that system, when you have full rank, so this is very important, everything we're talking about in this table is assuming that we have a full rank matrix. Under those conditions, then this underdetermined system is consistent for all right-hand side vectors. And you will always have an infinite number of solutions. If you have a square system, which is full rank, then again, it's still going to be consistent for all right-hand sides. But you only get exactly one solution. And finally, if we have an overdetermined system, uh, so we have a, a something that is tall and thin, uh, then we have to be careful here. This is going to be consistent only when the right-hand side vector belongs to the column space of A. Otherwise, it will be inconsistent. But if it is consistent, you'll get exactly one solution. So we'll definitely be connecting these fundamental matrix spaces to uh, many other topics throughout the course. And in particular, we're going to be looking at how they help us understand the solution set to a system of equations.